You are now checking out The Win Podcast Where the everyday people Are the celebrities So, so let's, let's get, get to, to know them, them. Okay, Uncle Nassim You know, I mean Fortunately, I was able to To show his humanity And, 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 and mm-hmm. you know Bring that to the screen But in reality If someone else really wrote him He could have easily been Just like a guy that you hate Right. That you don't because he really is like I'm not racist. I'm not this. I'm not that. I'm not that. And that character is everything, you know. <laughs> but so if, if if that was a cardboard character, I wouldn't like playing him, you know. Yeah, you but, know what is so funny but, about Uncle Nasim? I, I will share with my experience that he's a likable character, and in my in my chair, I forgive his ignorance because he just doesn't know. He doesn't allow himself. To see that that's, that's it's like you brought to. you brought that there. Right? Yeah. Anybody else would have did that role. It's like oh, he's a dick. He's just like everybody else that's thinking this way. But I feel like I see the child in Uncle Nusim that he's like innocent in a way yeah. and was taught this. So he has a he, and he also you see his vulnerability and as well. his fear though too because you're you know you you're hiding something that's very taboo and Absolutely. you're scared. You're like a little kid, you know. Who who's one wandering around the world like okay how do I handle this? You, you you're exactly correct. I mean it's it's like living with a secret, you know, that you can't tell mm-hmm. anyone. It is causing you pain. You know how do you do that? And also to go back to his um, misgivings and his behavior, um, in a way it is you you just hit, hit it right on the money. Um, he doesn't know any better in a way. Part of him doesn't know any, any better. You know, you've got people who are like bred to be misogynistic, to be, um, to be racist, you know. No matter what you do, you can't change their mind, you know. And it's just like, uh, um, it's aggressive. It's not, um, you know, it's just a way of thinking. That's how your brain is wired. But when someone doesn't know, and we don't know, that's why throughout you know, the seasons to come, we'll even learn more. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, there's so many things, uh, you know, when you grow up in that culture, like you said, you're, you're, you're bred in a way, you, you learn, you know, uh, your experience of the United States is mostly via the news and TV. Yep. All right. So when you're watching news over there, that's the equivalent of Fox News, you know. Mm. So very, <laughs> like, you live in, yeah, you live in yeah. serious, you know. Yeah. It's like Fox News, you know. Yeah. It's very like wing, and and uh, and that's where you get your news from. That's where you learn about America. Mm. You learn about politics. When you watch movies, that's how you learn about New York. You know, when I moved to New York in 1990, my relatives would come, came over and like, "Why oh, are you going to New York? You know, there's so many black people there. It's so dangerous." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's what they see in the movies, so they don't yeah. know any. Mm-hmm. They don't know any better. They say, "Well, don't go to Harlem." Don't go to Harlem. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's where I'm from. Yeah. <laughs> but that's because they don't know any better. They just right. don't know any better. And then, um, it, can you it, take us back to how that you growing up? Like, what person have you become through that? Like, can you take us that through that yeah, your beginning? Sure, sure. I mean, my my story, my my journey has been like you know um, interesting because I was born in England. And um, both of my parents are Syrian. Um, and uh, at 10 years old, we just went on a Euro trip that ended in Syria. And we never went back to England. And I was 10. You know, I was part of my dad's master plan. He was living in England, I don't know, 18, 20 years. And, and so um, I was a little Brit kid in this, uh, introduced to a new culture. I didn't speak Arabic. My parents never taught me how to speak Arabic. There's, there was not one school that accepted me uh, because I didn't speak Arabic except for this Catholic school, private school. And I had to learn Arabic. And, you know, until I learned how to speak Arabic, I was bullied a lot. Mm-hmm. So I grew up really fast and I became like a real mm-hmm. tough kid. Like, really, like I was never bullied after 13. Never. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, it doesn't matter how big the person was. I was not well, I saw like your weightlifting you had so- pictures. I'm like, I <laughs> definitely, what, I would not bully you. I would not bully. That was at 13, right? Did you start? Yeah. Did you start the weightlifting? Is that when you started? No, no, no. I started, I started mostly here, you know, started that mostly here. But 
but then, you know, so I learned, I learned about the new culture and I, but it was very difficult for me to adjust because I was, you know, 10 years old, kind of like you have an early idea of what you want to do. For instance, for me, I wanted to be a football, a football player, a soccer player, mm-hmm. you know, that was, that was my dream. And then that dream was like, just, you know, was diluted and, yeah. and you know, dissipated. Uh, uh, and um, um, so I, I was pushed into focusing on my education. And all I was thinking about was really leaving and coming to America because it was a dream of mine my whole life yeah. to come to America. Um, so when York. did the acting start taking place? Well, the acting bug was in there, but it was very private. You have to understand, you can't talk about those things over there. You can't oh, say, man. I want to be an actor. Yeah. You just can't say, I want to be an actor. You know, you. it's like, uh, it's a joke. Why would I right. say that? And uh, so when I came here, I secretly wanted to be an actor and I started and there was some rejections and some issues that happened. I was, I was, uh, um, you know, I was promised by a producer, you know, all these uh, great things and stardom and all that stuff. And, and then of course I find out uh, um, later on that it was a different kind of acting he was trying to get me into. Mm. Oh, wow. (laughs) So, and I'm like, so I was so disheartened by acting. And I said, mm. um, I'm not going to act. I was very insecure. Um, was that here in New York? I was in New York, 1990, oh. 1990, 91. So I was always athletic and I was lifting weights. And people told me, you know, you should compete. Yeah. And, you know, bodybuilding, I feel, is the perfect sport for insecure people. Yeah. Because, sure. you know, we get to control how we look. Yeah. And you build the outer, but at the same time, the inside, inside is already suppressed. Yeah, so we can, we, we, yeah, we, we control our own vanity. You know, we, you know, we can look at ourselves when we want. We can mm-hmm. show whatever we want to show. That's why you see most bodybuilders either cover up if they're not happy with their size. Mm-hmm. Yeah, shape. they can, you know. So it was perfect for me, and then I started competing, and and I stopped thinking about acting and. Then I was invited to go back to Syria and uh, to compete in Mr. Syria mm. because they wanted me to represent them in the world championships. So I went down, I became Mr. Syria, and uh, um, and then I just wasn't happy and I came back and, you know, uh, I was miserable, really, as a bodybuilder. And, uh, you know, life took over and then I had to make some choices. And one of them was, what do I want to do with my life? And I took an acting class. I was 29. Mm. And I just loved it. Mm. I loved it. And then I was in this acting class for a year and a half. All I knew that I loved it. I wasn't learning anything. I was literally learning nothing. I loved my teacher. She was great. (laughs) And I loved memorizing lines because (laughs) in my mind, mind, you know, I was like, Oh, you just have to memorize the lines and do them in a certain way. <laughs> and then I was fortunate to be uh, 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 directed to the William Esper Studio, which is a okay. very well-known mm-hmm. school. Studied there, and and then that was it. And then I never looked back. I when looked what back. what what did you learn about I guess about yourself through acting? Because it seems like once you finally gave in. It showed you a lot of happiness. That's one. And what a passion. And I think in that moment, too, you was like, you took your power back. You was like, you know what? I'm not going to be what certain people want me to be within family, or I'm not going to go this route bodybuilding. Let me just go full force into acting. Because honestly, when I watch you on screen, and this is not because, you know, you're on this podcast, yeah. you do have a gift for it. And it's great to hear this story that, like, you bounce back and forth. Because you're very natural mm-hmm. watching it. And it's and that's a beautiful that's something you can't be taught. You know, it's like one of those things that you have. It's and not you, forced. Yeah, it's not it's forced. So you can train at it mm-hmm. and you know, practice because right. mastering the craft, but it's still a gift to like naturally be on screen and give yourself. And I feel like from what you shared with me, I was like, wow, this guy's like a very seasoned actor that's been doing this for years, but you have been going back and forth. So what did that bring to your life, the whole acting, and once you made that, that point? First, thank you for the compliment. Uh, it's funny because you work so hard, in the end, you just have to 
you work so hard to achieve the simplicity of it mm-hmm. because in the end, all you have to do with anything you do, even with Uncle Masim, he's so different than me, but really in a way, I just have an impediment and I lend myself to the circumstance and I have a strong point of view and that's it. And I do it. And it just, you, you, you have to make it effortless. And with anything else, you know, I try to tell people all the time when I, you know, friends of mine, like, you don't have to do too much, really. You just have to lend yourself to the material. And and if you have good, if you're lucky to have good writing like we do, then it's just mm-hmm. like makes it even easier. But my journey as an actor, like, uh, it, it, it's funny you said that because like when I was, when I was 19, 20, when I f- first came here and I <laughs> wanted to be an actor, I was like most 18, 19 year olds. I wanted to be a star. I wanted to be yeah. famous. I wanted Hollywood. I wanted money. I wanted the riches. That's my idea. I wanted to be like Van Damme, you know, that was, that was my idea. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then, and that was my first uh, uh, um, um, idea about acting. And then when I came back to it at 29, I, it made me happy. So I said, I love acting because it makes me happy. Mm. It really makes me happy. And then I started training. I started, you know, the two year program right after, like a week after nine 11. And I, I had been struggling the whole time before with my just identity because, you know, there was certain parts of like, you know, shame sometimes because you don't want to engage. You feel guilty, like everything bad that's happening in the world. And you, you some somehow you're like automatically associated with it. Like I even changed my name in the 90s from Lath oh. to Leah. I didn't want to tell people that I was from the Middle East, you know, so I didn't want to have that conversation. Mm-hmm. And, um, but like nine 11 happened. And uh, while many people were doing what I did back then and changing their names and trying to not be associated, I did the opposite, but I, cause I felt like, okay, now, we're being demonized and and it and it helped me really go deeper into who I am along with the training and really find my identity as uh, as uh, you know as Arab you know Arab mm. Brit American all so um, so then my idea of acting became I love acting because it's going to give me a voice. Mm. I don't know when that voice is going to come, Love but it's going to come. And now it's coming. Now I have that voice. I have a platform. I'm talking to you. I can talk about issues. I'm, uh, you know, uh, so that's, uh, did that answer? Yeah. Yeah. That was very beautiful. And it was. And I feel like uh, you going into yourself even yeah. more made that grow. So it's because acting is about you. It's about you at the end of the day. Absolutely. I, I, I agree. I felt like, I felt like, so when I was in the improv, when I was training at the UCB, I loved this one teacher and it reminded me uh, what you said about pretty much the experiences is what you're pulling from when you're on stage and when you're, um, all, you know, in the written material and also working on yourself. So he said, um, yeah, you know, I could teach you all these tools to be funny. I could tell you these tricks, these other things, but at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. Uh, the biggest advice that I could give you is actually leave this class and go live life. Because the more experiences you have the and more heartbreak mm-hmm. and laughter and tears, and you're going to come back and that stage is going to light up for you because you have so much to bring mm-hmm. rather than yeah. trying to be funny, trying to be an actor. You're just going to be. And I think like, you know, I think for you acting was like that, that, that piece that you needed. You had the training. That build the muscles that also try to suppress the insecurities. You had the food, the, the family that you was conflicted with, the identity. And like you said, the acting gave you the voice, but also the work to push of like, who am I? What do I really want to do? What am I running from? What am I going to face? How can I become powerful within myself and build myself up? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I think for me, that, uh, to be an actor or a uh, creative artistic person, I think knowing who and what you are and trying to uh, become one with that, you will see so much more success and a lot of things that come your way. I agree. I agree. 
<laughs> um, how was the? How did you prepare for Uncle Nassim? Yeah. What What was the process for that for you? So, because now you're putting your, you know, you have the written material, but now you're also putting, you know, yourself and maybe your experiences to that. Like, what? How? What did you do to prepare for this role? And what helped? What didn't? Take us down because I, I, I fucking love you in that in that show, man. I, Me too. I love the show. First of all, I, I saw it. I'm all, I'm all for shows that have heart, oh, different, man. going for it. The first season was beautiful. Then we Did you watch the second, second season? And yeah. we saw the second season. I said, these motherfuckers Ooh. did it. They got even <laughs> What? I, like, these I want to watch it again. It was like, they got <laughs> deeper. They got funnier. Like They pushed it to another level. Another that, like, level. I feel like if you're an actor's actor, you're like, oh, yes, Ooh. give me that vulnerable. Give me... Give me the pain. But give the me the stories, laughter and the stories. Yeah. It was beautiful. Everything was good. So I want to know that how did you prepare? I guess like from season one to season two, just getting into Uncle the scene. I mean, season. I mean, season two was just like a easy transition. You know, it was just about getting the material, and and season two was even even easier because season two, they know me from season one, mm -hmm. and. So they were just writing for me. Mm -hmm. So like, season one was on the page. On the page, they created this character. Then I brought that character to life, and they saw what worked. So every word that was written really was something that would that Uncle Nassim would say. So it was like I, there's no need to improv. No need, you know. We did a little bit here and there, but yeah. um, you know, it, it, it was incredible. I mean, for the first season, I'm like. It's uh, uh, like, first of all, the first thing I had to do is like, I, I, I wanted to find, I wanted to create, like, you know, part of when you're creating a character, you have to find these little, you, you know, you have to find a strong point, have a strong point of view. You find some impediments, you know, you find the physicality, right? All those things and, and, and the look and all, they all add up to creating this whole yeah. thing. So. So when I started working first on the on the accent, um, um, I didn't want to do like a full on like Egypt like in English. I didn't want to do full on Egyptian. I didn't want to do the typical like Middle Eastern accent that I use all the mm -hmm. time. I wanted to have like a mix of them because also the character was like he was he's Palestinian Egyptian, right? Mm -hmm. So um, so I created that and that helped me. That was the first thing that I did. And then, then after that, like the, I, me I remember Rami, Rami was, I've known Rami since he was 17. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But to be in, yeah, what are you doing? I said, like, I'm getting ready for the audition tomorrow. And he came up here and, and he was like, um, um, you know, he came and we started reading together. I said, what are you going to look like? And I slicked my head back. I said, I'm going to stick my head back <laughs> and wear this, you know, tacky shirt. And, and we started reading it together here, you know, uh, and, uh um, yeah, I mean, and he recorded it. And the story is that later on, because he, he was texting, he said, well, I texted Hulu from your apartment. They, they had your, you know, you were cast out. <laughs> wow, that was <laughs> great. I was going to ask you. <laughs> urban legend, I don't know. So in case <laughs> Rami it, one day, I don't know if it's true or not. We did go out there what a very rack, relaxed audition, right? Though. Like that was. You didn't have to go through a process over and over. <laughs> I, auditioned, I auditioned for the pilot initially, and I didn't get the part, and I was so depressed, and he's like, mm. I was so upset because I usually don't get upset losing out on a part because, you know, I'm like, there's another part. Yeah, exactly. Um, um, never been that kind of guy, but uh, this one I'm like, oh my god, because like I'm never gonna have another show like this. And, mm. and Rob, like, don't worry, I got something. You know, I got something. I got something for you. Mm. Don't worry, but I got something for you. And then nice. you know, yeah, I still had to earn it. I still have to go in front of the producers yeah, and all yeah. that stuff. Yeah, yeah. But he, he knew that I could do it. He knew that I could do it. What, so, why? Was, why is this show so important for you, and why, and also for? for viewers like us to watch this? Why do you feel like this show is the show to be watched? Well, I mean, first of all, like, I'm sure you too, you're like, you're, you're working and you're thriving to get on, on the one thing that fulfills everything for you. And, yeah. and 
you feel like, okay, this is what I've been waiting for, you know? Mm -hmm. well, every job, I, I never take anything for granted. Every job I do, like I enjoy and I treat it like, like okay, I'm so lucky to be on the set, even if I'm playing a, a, a fucking terrorist, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm happy, I'm making money, I'm this and that, and, you know, and, uh, um, um, but with this one, you know, you have a character that's, that, it, oh, first of all, the representation is incredible. You have a show where all the leads are like, like you know, uh, Middle Eastern or North African, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, um, <laughs> and the writing is incredible. The stories are relatable. It's, it's very uncomfortable. It's thought provoking, right? And it's a lot of fun. And I feel also the most important thing is that Rami, Rami, um, and the way he writes, I'll give you an example. Yeah. You go to, I go to a lot of comedy shows, like, you know, like Arab comedy shows, like stand up. And the comedians, they go up there, they're funny, right? But they're funny for an, an Arab crowd, they, they understand the jokes yeah. and they're funny, blah, 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 right? But Rami goes and he'll talk about anything, Arabs, whatever it is, but everyone will laugh because everyone will find a way to relate. Mm -hmm. And so when he does this show, the way he writes it, everyone relates to it. Like, you see, yeah, he has a problem, but oh my God, you dealt with the same problem. I know mm -hmm. that happened to me. So, mm -hmm. so, the, so the culture gets erased in, in a way, like it's not like, Oh, an Arab show. It's not a Muslim show. Yeah. It's a show about this Arab guy, but he has the same problems that I have. Yep. You know? And, and when you're able to do that and relate to so many different people and all kinds of people, it's incredible. It's a gift. As opposed to like, you know, doing a show where you have a certain audience, you have this and that. And, but this one is like, it makes people feel, it made my dad feel uncomfortable. I don't think he was able to watch it. Really? Mm. Did you yeah, ever have a conversation? Oh, so he didn't watch it at all. Syria, like, no, my mom watched it. She loved it. She thought, okay. it was, you, know, you know, but I think it just made him feel very uncomfortable because, you know, he's, you know, he's old yeah, school. He's, he's, yeah, he's, he's old school. He's pushing a lot of buttons of like, yeah, let's talk about it. Let's, mm -hmm. this, I don't feel this is right. Or, yeah, I should be better than this. And I feel like, yeah, the, 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 the you know, to me, I learned a lot about the Muslim culture. Right. Mm -hmm. That I learned that. And it's funny because the things that I laughed at, I was like, wow, I learned that from like either the media, you know, whatever those jokes were being portrayed in that thing. I was like, but there's more to being a Muslim, you know, and I related to someone just trying to find his place in this world, not even in the religion, just in this world. How do I fit with this with religion? Family, How do I with, with my family, my friends, my relationships? Who, who, the, who, who and what am I? You know, like. I keep on repeating the same mm -hmm. steps. And also you feel frustrated with Rami too, because he, when he makes progress, it's like he goes backwards and fuck up and go back well, to his old ways. But then you, yeah. you but feel frustrated because, <laughs> yeah, because you were like, fuck, I, I've been there too. And you're like, come on, Rami. Like you, you, yeah. you know this already, but you're like yelling at yourself. Like, come on, Rick, yeah, yeah. You, you did this already. So yeah. Yeah. I think that's why I love about it. It's so relatable. You know, you, it takes you yeah. on this journey and every character takes you on that yeah. journey too. You get uh, an insight into, you get an insight, you get an insight into the culture, right? Through, through his eyes and his family's eyes. But it's not like, it's not everything about the culture. It's just like an insight into, uh, into the, yeah. into the beauty of the culture, right? Um, you know, it's not there to teach you about Islam, but it's, it's about teach you about how he's relating to Islam and right. what he's trying to be a good Muslim, you know, and you know, we all have flaws. We're all trying to, everyone's trying to be the best version of themselves. And, 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 and it doesn't matter whether it's uh, um, in the eyes of God or for themselves. And, and we're going to keep on working on ourselves forever. And this is a guy and that's his, that's his thing, you know, Oh, well, how, oh, how supportive yeah. is your family yeah. now? Um, you know, before, yeah, with acting and with your journey, how you know you just yeah, came here. And your mom was like, "Don't go." No, no, how they're all. They? Yeah, they're all. I mean, I mean, they knew when I came to America that I'm not going back. But um, 
Yeah, there's, I mean, in the beginning when I moved to acting, you know, I had like people, because, you know, when I became Mr. Syria, I had two lifetime friends and we, together we opened like a gym uh, in Damascus that's the first of its kind. And it was like co-ed, it was like incredible. Mm -hmm. And you now we were getting like threats from like religious figures and stuff. Mm -hmm. oh, you can't have women train with guys, but we did it. And then we started a trend and now there are gyms mm -hmm. all over the place. Mm -hmm. and, and I was getting offers to like just put my name on gyms and just build like a whole uh, freaking franchise, and mm -hmm. and I didn't want to do that. I was just my parents wouldn't understand; they couldn't understand why, and I just wasn't happy. And then when I told them I want to be an actor, they're just like, "What? You want to be an actor?" Because <laughs> you know, everyone knows it's like, you know, if it's not impossible, it's very difficult. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so I kept on just like you know feeding them what they need to hear, you know, like, oh, just another year, just one year, I'm, I'm going to try it, and then I'm going to quit, and then <laughs> another six months, you know, and like, and then I started working, and and uh, they saw, oh, wow, he's good, he can, he can do it. Well, you're an example to them. You set an yeah. example that, like, yes, I know that you're from the old school, and, you know, get an office job or be a businessman, blah, 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 that's the secure way, you know, that's the way. But you show them a different route, which is your, even though if they may not say it to you, you are an inspiration to them. Like, I guarantee, like, if someone else in the family says, I want to be an actor, and they'll, they'll mention you. It was like, well, I know someone that was, who, who is doing it. You know, you may not have all the riches and all the bookings in the world, but you're doing it and you are successful. Yeah, it's a hard thing, though, because you have to, you know, you really have to want to do it for the right reasons because that's the yes. only way that's that's the only way that can keep you sane and and yes. you can that can help you pull through the hard times you know uh, i've been through so much trying to pursue this and uh the only thing that kept me going is my passion and and my desire to do it and for the reasons that i wanted to and i know part of it you don't think about it, but you know, riches—they come with it if you find if you find that kind of success. But that wasn't never my motivation. My motivation was to do good work and make a living out of uh, you know from acting. Uh, but now, what's happening now? I never in my life ever thought that uh, you can ask me any time in the past twenty years, like, oh, do. What do you want to do? You want to win awards? I'm like, no, no, I don't think about awards. I don't. It's not. It's not part of my thought process because mm -hmm. it's like something that's very difficult, very rare. Mm -hmm. It's like, uh, uh, in a way, a pipe dream. And so, if it happens, it happens. But, but like, so now, like, you know, there's all this Emmy talk for, for the show. Mm -hmm. all, a lot of us in it mm -hmm. too, and and it's it's fascinating. It's just if you just keep doing good work, things do happen. I mm -hmm. I so believe in that. Um, your job is to just William Esper was my teacher my second year teacher and like a father figure to me um, he always said he said you know your job your job is to audition and getting the job is your vacation mm. <laughs> like working that. you feel like you're on vacation it then is, you get paid it's true it's true <laughs> hey, oh my god you get paid for doing this <laughs> <laughs> What was a lesson from him that you learned that that even to this day helps you maybe if you dealing with rejection, um, not getting a part, or what was something that you learned from him uh, that there helps you? Two things. There were two things. Um, there were two things that, and I think the first one, he, when he told me, um, uh, he, he told me this, it, it, it had an immediate effect. And when I advise people sometimes, when I advise people sometimes, uh, it, 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 when they really take it and understand it, it helps them. I remember I was, I had a, had a second call back for, I can't remember which director was, some huge director, Paul Greengrass or something, mm. a long time ago, over 15 years ago. And, and it was for a nice, nice role. I, it was my second call back. And and I was so nervous. I was at the studio because I work. I work. I work for him at the at the William Esper Studio, mm -hmm. and and <laughs> I was so nervous. And you can see, I'm asking, "What's wrong?" <laughs> like, what, "What's wrong?" I'm like, 
no, I have this, I have this big, I have this big audition, I have this big audition bill. So, so, so what? What's a big deal? Like, no, 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 you don't understand. It's huge. It's a big, it's a big deal. This guy is big. I'm like, well, okay. So, so, so why are you so concerned? Like, well, because, you know, it's important. It's so important. It could change my life. I'm like, well, you're not going to get the part. I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> I guess, oh, like, you're not going to get the part. I'm like, no, that's not nice. That's not nice. I said, no, you're not going to, they're probably going to give it to someone who they're going to make an offer to somebody else. And you're like, they're just seeing other people. You're not going to get it. You know, you go in, you do a good job because they'll call you in for the next part. You're auditioning for the next part. You're not auditioning for this part. Mm-hmm. And, and my God, he was so right. It was the <laughs> best thing. So whenever I audition, I just, I, I have no pressure of getting that part. And I'm thinking about building that relationship so the casting director will call me in. And it happened all the time. It happened with that casting uh, director too. So, uh, you know, I tell people that sometimes. Sometimes they just, you know, they're as emotional as I was. And I understand. Yeah. <laughs> you really do have to let it go. So that was one lesson. That was one lesson. Big one. Important lesson. And the second one, because there's, there are a million reasons why you won't get the part. Really, yeah. literally. You 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 don't look it. Your your hair is not right. Your you you your mustache is not right. Whatever it is, you have a pimple in your face. Yeah. Whatever it is, I don't. Or nothing but, that has to do with you too. <laughs> it could be something else. One, there's only one re- one reason that you can control, and that's your work. Exactly. You go and you do a good job, and you can't control anything else. You know, so that's your job is to go in and do a good job. And, and that's it. The second thing he told me, because I was so always afraid, I never trusted myself. And and trusting uh, uh, trusting your process is a huge, huge deal. And that's the difference between people who work effortlessly and people who push, you know, because you watch sometimes something and you just like, ah, I don't care. I'm, I don't care. Yeah. You're crying. This doesn't mean anything to me. I don't feel anything, you know. And and it comes from fear. It doesn't mean that person's a bad actor. It's, it's because they could be a good actor, but they're not trusting themselves. And I was one of those actors. I never, I never trusted myself. And, uh, and I always felt that I have to feel it. I have to I, I do my preparation and I have to feel it. If I don't feel my body, that means it's not there. And he would say, do your preparation and let it go and trust that it's there. It will come out when it needs to come out. And um, I remember I was in the desert in, 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 in uh, Phoenix, in Arizona, when, when I figured it out. And I called him from over there from the middle of the desert. I'm like, I figured it out. I let myself go. It was there. It was there. It was good. You know, so, so that, those are two big lessons. I mean, a million lessons. The guy yeah, yeah, was yeah, like, yeah, of course. That's like it. the Gandalf of, 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 uh, acting right. teaching whatever he, he knows everything so a million nuggets from him that i use all the time but those mm-hmm. two are very big and very important and i think important to any actor it's trust because we're just so afraid and we get in our head because we want to get it right we want to do a good job we want to impress and this and that and then we forgot about we forget about the the next moment yeah mm-hmm. and being like, open to everything or- to around you to receive those moments and yeah. and, and being in that being moment. present yeah and now letting mm-hmm. this you know there's like so many things that happens when you're auditioning or when you're on stage it's like so many things that can interfere and knowing that like you have to block that but remain open for those emotions to pour through so i don't know i feel like it's one of like it's such a beautiful art form but there's a lot that goes to it as well mm-hmm. to like how yeah. you said just to make it like natural like, have you done theater? I've done. I was just gonna. I was just gonna give you a theater example. So funny. Yeah, oh, I've, done, okay. I've done a lot of theater. I've done. Uh, I mean, there was a point that uh, I was doing one or two equity plays a year, um, and I had a play that I wrote uh, that was produced at the Rattlestick five years nice. ago. Oh, okay. Yeah, but I, I remember. I was gonna. <laughs> I love doing plays because plays make you really feel alive. You get to have mm-hmm. full experience, and that's when. That's that's a big testament to one's skills because most of the time 
something goes wrong mm-hmm. and then you have to adjust. Like I, I remember my first play um, at the Rattlestick, I don't know, 15 years ago or something. And, and it was with this incredible actress, Roz Coleman. I don't know if you know Roz. Oh, yes. Yeah, she's amazing veteran um, actress and um, helped me a lot, guided me through so many things. And uh, it was my first big play, and uh, you know, playing a big part in it. And so I was blind in the whole play. I was blind. So I had that impediment. And I was on stage in 11 out of 13 scenes. And there was a scene where, uh, <laughs> there was a scene where I'm, I'm sitting in this house. It's a war-torn country. And, and then she comes in and I'm like, my first line is like, where have you been? So I'm sitting there and, you know, smoking a cigarette and just being you know, blind and, and, and waiting for her and she's not coming. It's like 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds. She's, you know, so I started humming a song and like whatever, mumbling under my breath, but I stayed in the moment the whole time. It stayed in the moment the whole time. So if you stay in the moment the whole time, whatever it is, anything you do is coming out of that moment. Mm-hmm. It saved the, the moment. And then she came in and, and I'm like, and then I used it like, where have you been? <laughs> <laughs> but it turns out she was in the bathroom puking her guts out. She was so sick oh, wow. and she was like puking. And it was like, and, and there's another testament. Yeah. She was like dying and she came out and gave, a fucking amazing performance, you know, highly emotional, uh, you know, what she was going through. So that's, um, you know, (laughs) that's, uh, that's, that's one of the other examples of many other things, you know, go wrong. um, You just, uh, no, go ahead. I was going to say, um, in bodybuilding, I feel like, you know, there's a lot of positive too, that also mental uh, Mm -hmm. strength and courage that goes into this stuff. Uh, do you feel that also helped you to be an actor in a positive way? Like, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. The um, I was talking about that with a friend uh, a couple of days ago. Um, who was a bodybuilder back in those days, uh, and she's a fitness trainer. And uh, um, we talked about the discipline, mm-hmm. and because when you get ready for a show. You get on the diet for like 16 weeks and it's so strict. I mean, it gets to the point where like you find other ways to clean your teeth with your fingers. <laughs> you want to use toothpaste because it's yeah. the sugar. And the toothpaste. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wow. Yeah. So that's how strict uh, um, I was. And um, wait, hold on. Before you go forward, toothpaste can really like trigger your, your body. Look, like- so for sugar? But I'm talking. I'm talking about like when your body is so starved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're so oh, starved, right? And then you're getting ready to get close to the show. You have you, you're depleted, right? And your body's starving. That's why you can, if you 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 know, used to read like you know a guy like before he went on stage, he had one date, right? And it messed up his body. He ate yeah. a date <laughs> because you know the, the the you know it triggers. I don't know about. I can't talk about you know, how the yeah. body works and whatever, but, you know, you start producing yeah. things yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and stuff like that. So um, it's just like diet. If you're dieting and if you're dieting and then uh, for, for months and then you have a Diet Coke, your body oh, yeah. thinks it's sugar. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. so it starts reacting as if it's real sugar because it yeah. tastes like sugar. It tastes sweet. So that's discipline I did take to acting because I was so disciplined. Um, I wish I could be disciplined now trying to like be in shape again. <laughs> I need deadlines. But <laughs> it, it goes perfect with Uncle Nassim. <laughs> yeah, I need to get like a Marvel picture and say, hey, we need you to get in shape. I'm like, yep, you got it. A <laughs> million dollars would do it. <laughs> oh, I want to ask, how was it working on set with everyone and Rami? Like, what is the the vibe and the environment like to work? Because it's one thing to like, you know, 
you know, working with yourself and bringing that into character. But then there's another element, uh, element now working with everybody and a team. a team and piecing it together. Well, you know, I credit Rami with everything uh, because he, he sets the tone of the set and everything and the vibe. And all I can tell you is that he knows every single person's name. He probably knows their birthdays too. He just knows everyone and he has a personal relationship with everyone. You know, no one's job is too small uh, 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 for him. Everyone's job is equally as important. So we go on set and everyone knows each other. Everyone's so friendly. Everyone's happy to be there. I've been on so many sets where people are miserable. Just yeah. oh, oh my God. walk into the makeup room and they're just, ah, oh God, we got to do another actor. You know, but here you walk in the makeup room and it's like a party. Yeah. Like, what do you want? What music you want to listen to? And oh, they that's great. dancing and singing, and you know, and the PAs are begging, please, please, we need the on set. I'm like, wait a minute, this is not over. Not the set. Yeah, so we're having fun, and we go in, and we just like, it doesn't matter. Like, we, whatever, whatever they ask you to do, you do it because you're just loving it, and you're having yeah. fun, and it's so much respect. You know, extras treated with utmost respect uh, um, as equals. Uh, it's just great, man. And yeah. rare, like... It's, it's rare like to a, have that, yeah. It's like a perfect experience. It's so, like, it's, it's everything's in sync. I hear that a lot in a couple of directors where their main focus, because, you know, if you, they, they trust their actors. It's like, you, as an actor, you be prepared, you know. But their main focus is to have a relaxed set because they know if the actors and everyone is relaxed, then that's going to open up so much more uh, in the scenes and even the relationships and build so much more. Yeah, I, I, I'm telling you, man, this season, I heard Rami say he never wants to do this again. But <laughs> because of schedules and conflicts, you know, Mahershala was doing so many other things. He had so many obligations. So we had a small window to do all his stuff. So... They were crossboarding like, like I remember the they, they did the uh, you know they were crossboarding in the beginning seven episodes so we will shoot like episode two then episode eight and then this oh, and that and I shot I started I started with my episode I'm like whoa can I just roll into it like no I started <laughs> right away with my episode so it um it was hard and that's hard you know for Rami he's keeping track of everything and he's always writing he's always he's always doing something. He's directing, and he's a showrunner. He's writing, he's acting, yeah. and um, but yet you'll never, you'll never, you never see that. You'll never feel it. Mm. You just feel like, oh, everything is so easy. Oh. Everything is so smooth. Nobody yeah. brought, nobody brought their baggage to the, to the, to the, to the set. That's important. We, we don't, nobody brought it to the set. Is there a project that you want to create and work I was on? Gonna, oh, yeah, oh, yeah so that was the question. So question. Go no, ahead. have you ever <laughs> have you thought of um, writing your own your own piece? Because you have a lot. I've written, I've written, I've written a lot. I have something I'm working on. Um, right. You know, with, with some producer. I'll, I'll announce it soon. I don't want to announce anything. No, 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 no. But no, of good, great. But I promise you'll be the first one to. We you would know, love. Allowed to announce it. We're working. Yeah, I have several things. I've, uh, you know, written a, a play. I've written a one-man show. Nice. Um, I don't know what it wants to be because I literally wrote 10 one-man shows. It's like I wrote about 300 pages, and <laughs> all I need is 30. <laughs> but I, I'm writing life, you know, dealing with this and that, uh, uh, this problem, that problem. Mm. It could be so different ones, a book. So many things you can do with it. Maybe if I have people are interested one day, I don't know. We'll see. We'll no, that'll be but... great. I'll, I would love to uh, check too. it out whenever you do it. it. I feel like you have, from the time that you shared here, it, mm -hmm. it has been, it's been a short time, but I feel like you share so much. I feel like there's so much inside of you that you can share on stage. Uh, it's one of my, it's one of my, uh, my best attributes and, and one of my downfalls is like, I'm <laughs> just like, I'm, I'm open. I talk. Yeah. <laughs> Were you always like that, or you felt like acting opened you up even more? I was. Um, well, acting definitely opened me up more, you know. And yeah, but sure. uh, I was I was always very trustworthy, uh, 
and uh, more than I needed to be. So I'm very careful with that now. Uh, I'm very careful who I trust and how to reveal right. information. But but I have no problem like acting, acting and and learning about myself. Uh, um, made me get rid of the shame of telling a story. Like you know, like if some like if someone like if you if you got arrested one day in your life, yeah. right? You, there's there's part of you that might be ashamed to tell people because you'd be afraid to be judged. Mm-hmm. Where really it's not a big deal, you know. Mm-hmm. It's something that happened, and it could happen to anyone. Mm-hmm. And it's something you didn't hurt anyone. You didn't do anything. So there's all this, right. all this shame. And uh, now I don't have that. I'm I'm very free. Like for instance, I used to, you know, people used to ask me. Um, it's some some reason whenever you meet new people, they uh, one of the questions they ask you, I don't know, because I never, I, I, I'll never meet you and say, oh, so what are you, a Catholic? Are you? <laughs> <laughs> That's so, a Syrian. <laughs> Syrian. So are you Muslim? I'm like, I don't know why, why, why it matters, you know? <laughs> yeah. But there was a point where I would say, uh, uh, yeah, I was born a Muslim, but I'm not practicing, you know, because I was fear of, like, of judgment. Oh, like I'm right. going to be put in the box. Right, but now, no, I'm like I'm a Syrian Muslim, you know, um, and yeah, I'm a, I'm proud to, 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 you know, British American, and but I'm Syrian. My blood is Syrian, you know, and um, and for Islam, for instance, I'm not religious, you know, I'm, I'm respectful. I I believe you, you uh, 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 just don't do bad things, don't hurt people, and respect people. I'm trying to be a good person. And I think that that will uh, get you far, in, no matter what religion yeah. it is. But, and I'm not a religious scholar, but I uh, found myself in the past 10 years defending Islam all the time. I can't even have a conversation. If you have to talk to me about something uh, about Islam, I can't because all I'm doing is defending it because it's been demonized by yeah. society, by this country, by by the far right, by the media, by everything. Yeah. You see, so uh, to the point where like, you know, after 9-11, I remember the first thing after 9-11, I was standing with friends. I went, I volunteered in a line. I volunteered in a line. This was a big turning point for me. And this is probably the first time I'm talking about it. I, I volunteered on the line downtown. Uh, uh, they were just taking anyone to volunteer. So we were like, right before uh, Building 7 fell, we were like on a line waiting and then that building fell and then they, anyone who wasn't really a professional construction guy or, or, or uh, they just dismissed, like, go, we don't need you. But I remember when I was there, right, they were just like, you know, everyone was angry, of course, everyone was, I was angry. Yeah. But like, everyone started like screaming like, fuck the Palestinians, Fuck the Palestinians! Fuck the Palestinians! Because everyone thought, everyone thinks that Arabs are Palestinians, <laughs> <laughs> and um, and uh, that all Arabs are Palestinians. I mean, yeah. and and I found myself like I'm in this group, and I was with some friends who didn't know me. They thought I was just another white guy with long hair and shit. And I was like, I found myself with them, like. The Palestinian fuck, like mouthing it or like struggling with it because yeah. I just didn't want to be like the guy who's like, "Why aren't you saying it? Why are you sympathizer?" Yeah. You know, because I felt like already I felt like, "Oh my god," I felt guilty that yeah. I did this, and and that's what happened with society because we were demonized too because everyone else was demonized. Yeah. You know, when Timothy McVeigh, uh, you know, killed people, Christians weren't demonized, but so. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's what that's what happened, and um, and that was a big awakening for me. Like you know what, I'm fucking Arab, and my name is Leith. I didn't I didn't go by Leo anymore. I'm like I'm I'm Leith and I'm Arab and I'm I'm not ashamed of it. I'm not deal with it. it. Took a long time. I still to this day you always have, you know. Um, sadly, just it never goes away. Like this sense of kind of weird guilt like like you know i have a beard you know you see my beard i mean it's really big and scary yeah. i like it <laughs> <laughs> it's not 
some people, man. Some people, man. And I didn't like I, I didn't shave it for a long time before the show and yeah. after the show and and I'll be sitting on the train and you know people like they look and they're like well, yeah. they don't know what yeah. to make of you and again you put in the box but I have this trick that I do and even even with cop I love I love a lot of friends of mine they're cops and I'm you know I'm, I'm nothing against the good ones but exactly all, me too yeah there's, all, there's also this fear I have like I won't lie. And uh, like, if I'm walking in front of walking by cops, I feel oh my god, looking at me, I feel guilty already. I feel like yep. yeah, <laughs> I've done and you didn't do so, shit. <laughs> but I have the perfect trick, and it always works because it puts you at ease. And uh, and they what know is it? you they, put your hands up, you start putting. No, your hand put, up. <laughs> no, no, no. I pull out. I always have. Always have. Have a, a copy of sides in my bag, highlighted oh. side. I pull them out and I start reading them and mumbling, going like this. Blah, blah, blah. They know people when they see sides highlighted, they know you're an actor. <laughs> That's <laughs> like, so <true. laughs> If there ever ever was a thought, man, yeah. I, <laughs> motherfucking actor. <laughs> it works. Do it if you ever feel like oh. comfortable. Pull outside. I would do That's that. Great. That's great. I'm just great. gonna keep it in my bag. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna I'm I'm read it, and I'm gonna like, I am innocent. I didn't do anything. I don't have no gun on me. I'm just going. I'm just going over the script. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so uh, we're gonna move. We're almost done. So we're gonna we got this last segment that we do, and the segment is called uh, "Let's Look Inside," and it's three questions to the segment. And the first oh question, is, huh? oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> don't worry, this is not one of those things where a uh, porno or anything like that. <laughs> I'll, I'll uh, ask the first yeah. question. It can't, it can't get any worse than the year of nineteen ninety. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> When I when I walked into an office and saw all these, you know, porn posters, so it can't be worse than that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but you just turned back on the biggest moment of your career, right there. So, <laughs> you know what? I I, I don't think it would have worked out anyway. So let's. <laughs> like, all right. So the first question is: What do you love about yourself? It's funny. And I love people. And, uh, and yeah. All right, that's great. Uh, the, second, the second question is, what does the American dream mean to you? American dream is finding what makes you happy. Love it. Last question. The last question is, if the average lifespan was 40 years, how would you live your life? differently um i don't know if i i don't know if i would have i would just like i that's my journey and if it ended at 40 40 wasn't bad Mm. bad. only i became good at what i did i have this thing i say like at 30 at 30, you know what you want to do with your life. At 40, you become good at it. At 50, it becomes second nature. Ooh. I love that. You I made that, that up too. or you heard that somewhere? No, no. I'm, uh, I, it didn't, I, this is my philosophy. It's not like I'm, I love I'm that. It. You I should write, write that, that down. down. You should write that down, put it in a poster. I actually love that. Me too. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, um, and it's also so true. I mean, you know, you have a lot of people when they start acting when they're young and they're doing it for whatever reason they don't know, they, and then they get into other things. And but when you see someone who's, like, really at it and, uh, like, at 30 and they're still acting, you know, this is what they want to do. You know, finally know what you want to do with your life. Your 20s are just for, you know, you're exploring. Exploring, mm-hmm. exploring, love, exploring everything. Like most relationships, like in the twenties, they're like, you know, I mean, you know, every now yeah, and then, yeah, yeah. Maybe, 
you guys will get lucky. But for the most part, you know, like a 30 is very different. It's yeah. a big year. It's a big year. The 40 was incredible. Like I, I became good at it. Yeah. Um, I have, this is not even part of it, but I just had a question that came up to my, to my head. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you have this long lifespan of, of life so far. You have so many trials, tribulations, success. You know, if you just take a moment to look back on everything that you've been through, the ups and the downs, like what is something that stands out to you that, that no matter what you just kept on pushing, like, what is that view for you? If you just take the moment mm -hmm. to look at everything and, and to this present moment now. So can you can you just rephrase it again? Say it again. So when you take a moment to look back on your life and everything that you've been through, you know, family, working out, acting, rejection, you know, what is something that you consistently see in those 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 moments? I never give up. And that's what people tell anyone who knows me for a long time, they'll tell you, fucking Lath, man. He just never gives up. I like, never gives up. When I was, you know, bodybuilding, I never like, I remember bodybuilding. I was working out in Syria once before. I don't know if you're going to use this or not, though, but uh, but uh, I was working out in Syria once before I came to the States. I was always athletic. And I was, I, I wanted to do um, uh, a novice contest. I was like a skinny kid, like with two, like, freaking muscles. And, you know, and they told me, like, don't eat bread, don't eat bread and get a tan and, and shave the five hairs you have on your chest, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I'll do that. So I was at the gym training hard, like, oh my God, barely seen. Oh, I can see a vein. <laughs> I'm training and I'm going like this. I'm making a pose in the window and in the mirror. And then this guy was like, uh, Mr. Syria, like he comes up to me, starts laughing. He was like, who do you think you are? Like Arnold. And and then he touches my skin. He's got, you got, you have, you have thick skin. You'll, you'll never build muscle or get cut. And, you know, it, it stayed with me. He didn't. He didn't care for it then, but it stayed with me because it was part. It motivated me a lot. But the thing is, I started bodybuilding. I started competing. I said, I'm not gonna stop until one of the goals was to go back and become Mrs. Syria. Mm. And I went back, and not only did I go back, uh, I won Mrs. Syria, and I beat him. Nice. <laughs> That's I beat him. So. And then I became, at that time, I became like one of, they call me did the you, Enrique. I did became you go, really. Did you go back I, to him and like tap him? I was like, wow, you have thick you skin. You, you, you would never beat me. <laughs> you don't need to do that. Why? You smile. You just don't, hey, how you doing? <laughs> Same thing. Acting on people, people. I have stories of people saying things and, you know, like your dreams late streams are much bigger than he is. He needs to be realistic yeah. about his expectations. And, but I stick to it. So my, my childhood friends are like, they're not surprised. They're like, because they know how stubborn I am. Yeah. You just never give up if you believe in it. You have to be realistic. You do have to be realistic. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm not going to pursue like a soccer career at 30 and say, I want to become play for Real Madrid. No, you got to be realistic. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. What you want to do. Um, but never give up. Never yeah. give up. I, don't, I think that's one thing that, uh, because life is so hard, and and when you try to do something that's difficult, the obstacles just pop up everywhere, no matter what it is. You know it. Definitely. You know, you, both of you are artists. You know, yeah. lucky, lucky to have each other to, mm -hmm. to 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 lean on each other. Yeah, but, it's true. Uh, it's still hard. It's still hard. The obstacles just come out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. uh, it's disappointments, you know. I, I mean, I got let go from a job walking to a set because they ran out of time. Uh, Spike Lee, a uh, Spike Lee uh, pilot. I was like on the going to the set, and and they said, "Oh uh, yeah, we're, we're pushing your time. We're pushing your time. Uh, we're running behind." Then I I went back home and get another call. They say. Uh, yeah, yeah, we, uh, you know, we're running behind. We're going to cut today. You're going to be shooting Wednesday. I'm like, okay. And then another hour later, I go, you know what? We're cutting the part. I was just so, like, so excited. And it was like, yeah. I had to stick for days. And I'm like, oh, I should quit every idea. Like, maybe yes. I'm not meant to. Mm. So. And then something pops up. 
and it's like whoop. yeah so you you have to be you have to be tough you have to be tough doesn't mean that you ignore everything doesn't mean that you can't be upset doesn't mean that you can't have a cry you can't be depressed for a night upset you can but you have to also you know keep going forward and moving mm -hmm. forward because uh <laughs> It's tough because even when you're working, like right now, I'm like, it's like the biggest year of my life and all these things happening. And now COVID came along and there's no work. There's nothing. I don't know what's going to happen. Yep. And people are panicking. Yeah. And so what? Yeah. Series regular and you just still don't know what the future is going to hold. But I'm going to stay positive. Yeah. Stay positive and know that good things will happen. You are now checking out The Win Podcast, where the everyday people are the celebrities. So, so let's, let's get, get to, to know, know them. them.